So, next speaker, you know it's going to be Jamie Oliver. In, <laughs> you get it, give him a big round of applause when he comes in. Um, some, some many years ago in the UK, I was watching a television program, there are a lot of television programs about chefs, cooking and stuff, and there was a boy who had taken his own funds and used them to go and find 15 unemployed, and I might add virtually unemployable young people who were from very disadvantaged backgrounds, and take these young people and teach them how to cook, how to be chefs, and how to run their own restaurants. And this television program, I forget now how many episodes it was, I was absolutely riveted. Here was this person spending so much time and patience and energy on these kids who didn't know whether they were interested or not. Sometimes they didn't turn up for work. And there was this chef getting in a car, going and finding the kids. Why didn't you come in today? Come on, guys. You know, me, I'm a parent. I would have been very angry. And then I found out that this chef was just 24 years old. And giving his time and his own investment to create what has become a chain of restaurants around the world, they're called 15. I think he's in, I say around the world, I shouldn't exaggerate, I think he's in four countries. And each of those restaurants does the same thing, goes and trains and helps disadvantaged young people, gives them a life, a career, and a job. And that's just one thing. But I was so struck by this very young boy doing this thing because this was not just television and cooking. This was world-changing leadership. This was the real deal. And since then, that same boy, a bit older now, has gone on to literally storm the government in the UK, saying the food that we are feeding in the schools programs is really bad for the children. What are you going to do about it? Alistair Campbell, who was Tony Blair's press secretary, told me a few years ago that in their first term in office, the only thing that had taken them by surprise and blown them off course was school dinners. Then Jamie, that's that not enough, goes to the United States and takes up the same issues. He genuinely was one of the inspirations for One Young World because you had to look at someone at 24 changing the world. He hasn't stopped since. And it's funny when you talk to him because he doesn't think he's done anything. He's a personal hero of mine, and we're going to look at a, vi a video link for him now. I want kids to be healthier. I want them to grow up with better habits. I want us to have a better, cooler, cleverer, healthier nation. Can Jamie Oliver change what Britain's kids eat at school? I haven't come to Robin to teach eight people how to cook. that you should come in here and tell us what to do. I want to introduce you to some of the people that I care about. Your public, your children. I want to show a picture of my friend Brittany. She's 16 years old. She's the third generation of Americans that hasn't grown up in a food environment where they've been taught to cook at home or in school or her mum or her mum's mum. She has six years to live. She's eating her liver to death. This is not the end. 
This is the beginning. Okay, I got notes. I hope I don't have to use them. Bless you all. Bless you all. It's a, a massive honour to be at this new uh, hub of clever people. Uh, I hope you get everything that you want from this conference. It's, it's amazing. Um, I had to be here. I had to be here because the more I learned about One Young World in its very short life so far uh, is about the fantasy and the ideas and the passion of young people and what young people can do. And, but I, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself just before we cruise off onto a very depressing 30 minutes about the world that we live in uh, and then hopefully be happy at the end. Um, I, I never grew up, thought, I, I never grew up thinking that I'd be having conversation with the Obamas and, and going to number 10 Downing Street and having like a thousand people walk behind me with banners and stuff like that. I never thought that was me. That wasn't me. I wasn't even political. I was a little kid from a little village, a little white village in Essex near Cambridge in England. I grew up in a working class home in a pub with a restaurant uh, and food. I was terrible at school. I came out of school with nothing. But food was my saviour. Food was, it filled me with hope and joy, and I loved to touch things and smell things. I loved people in a pub, which I come from. You get all sorts of people, rich, poor, you get gypsies, you get farmers. And I love learning to talk to different people. And that sort of saved me, really. And then as I became a chef and I started working around the country, getting to London, this kind of campaigning happened by fluke. It really did. So it started off not in food, but with young people, giving young people opportunities, starting up 15. Yes, I was inspiring them through food, and I was proving to the government that instead of spending £80,000 on a criminal, get, well, actually, they don't give me any money, and they've never given me any money in 10 years, sadly, but I spend £25,000, £30,000 to make them brilliant and make them have a job, and they all get jobs. And, you know, so it was really about giving young people opportunity, and I think that all of our countries can kind of see parallels with that. Rich or poor, opportunity, inspiration, leadership, mentoring, positive role models for young people. It's so important that it stays close, tight, and that we care about young people. And if we don't, woe betide us. And just recently in London, we've had riots. No one knew what happened. What's happened? Opportunities, positive role models, and, and, and the ability to dream. Okay, so let's just talk about food. I started campaigning in food, um, and it sort of led me down this path where I'm here today. Um, my life now involves me working, campaigning, researching, meeting a lot of scientists and specialists around the world. And, uh, you know, in the last few weeks, just to come and see you guys, you've got to understand this job for me today is the hardest one I've done on talking. And I don't do many talks. Normally, I go into a community or a town or a city or a country and talk about their program, uh, pro problems, which are also diverse and mixed. And here I am in front of all of you today, where we have hideous famine and the rise of diet-related disease side by side. So I'm not an expert in fam famine, and I need you to appreciate that. So Bob Geldof is. Um, but the things I'm going to talk today about do link back to those countries. So, in the UK, uh, we're one of the most unhealthy countries in Europe. We're one of the most unhealthy countries in the world. It's the first generation, along with many of your countries, where this generation is the first generation expected, the children of today are expected to live a shorter life than their parents. Now, I don't know if we've got the little graphic. We did a little question with you guys earlier. I said, how long do you think you guys are going to live? Okay? And there might, a little graphic might come up here. I can tell you, you're all dreaming. You're all dreaming. I can categorically say you're all wrong. I hope the statistics are right. You all think that you're going to live over 100, 90 to 100, 80 to 90. Look at the skew, yeah. 
The actual reality, and if you want to find out about reality, talk to any insurance company, right? The reality <laughs> is you're all dying before you're 70. Probably, you know, the, the, the new diseases... Uh, and the statistic of this is the first generation expected for our children to live a shorter life than our parents is under 60, right? So let's just let's recalibrate here. So the UK is not very healthy. I, I've worked a lot in Australia and America as well. Um, and I want to kind of... Just, I just want you to think for one second, right? I want you to go back to your country. If it helps to close your eyes, zen out, close your eyes. Um, Think of your country, think of your home, think of your family, think of hopefully the table or however you sit down to eat, think of the meal that represents your country and think about mum and dad and the laughter and joy and eating that food. What is that food? Tell me, what is that food you're eating? Do you know, how proud are you of that food? You're proud, yeah? Okay. So, before I get on to the serious stuff, the important thing to learn about food, for me, is joy, happiness, nourishment. It's also an excuse to gather people. You know, whatever religion you're in, you know, the table, food to eat is the altar of any home. And, you know, it brings people together. And, you know... We've got to remember that, because I'm going to give you some pretty miserable information now. Okay, so the biggest killer on the planet at the moment, or certainly one of the biggest killers, is diet-related disease. Um, and the most disgusting thing about it is it's preventable, man-made. We don't have to die from this. Um, the problem in my world, and maybe today I can inspire some of you to care and want to get involved in some of the stuff that I'm doing, but in my world, diet-related disease is not dramatic. It's not cool. It, it's not a great screen grab. It's not great on CNN. You know, um, the amount of people killed by diet-related disease uh, is way more than, say, gun crime in the UK or America and many, many other countries. Okay? Um, this is the first time when adults are handing back a country to you young people in a worse state than when they got it. Sorry about that. You've got a lot to do. But it doesn't mean you should sit back and do nothing. We, we've, we've got a lot to do. We have to start a food revolution. So I'm going to talk about three main issues today. I'm going to talk about obesity and diet-related disease. I'm going to talk about nutrition transition, which is a sort of scientific term. Uh, I'll explain that later. And then I'm going to talk about education. And then we might have a little chat about maybe what we could do together. So, we've got a beautiful mix of you guys in the audience today um, from many, many different countries. Um, obesity uh, is, in the last, certainly in the last 20 years, has gone, well, obesity and diet related disease has gone crazy. Uh, it's, out of it's out of control. Um, and it's not just affecting the Western world. It's rampaging through all the developing world as well. So it's very, very relevant to many, many people here. Uh, it's pretty, I mean, I think, I think it's, you know, from every, I mean, I've gone from being angry and slagging off certain people and companies, and I've had my five, six, seven years of that, and I'm trying to be mature now and think about reality and, and, and change and, and control my anger. And um, it, it, I think it's fair to say that Western-style diets are fairly responsible for this. Bad feeding, as the scientists call it. Um, it's massive uh, new injection of highly processed foods, uh, salt, sugar, fat, in everything. Um, the problem that we've got is we've actually got in America three generations, possibly four, certainly in England three, and probably the larger percentage of your countries, two to three generations of people that think this food is normal. Normal. Okay? They don't know the difference. Um, and, um, you know... The problem is that governments around the world, they love cheap food. Of course they do. We, we get that, yeah? Um, we love cheap food, um, and they like the shelves full. Um, but most governments around the world, if not all of them, don't have any food experts or, uh, <laughs> at the heart of government. And uh, we're paying for it now. 
The funny thing as well is, well, it's not funny at all, is that con us consumers, the public, we're paying for this. We're paying for this. So, two of the top five causes of early premature death on this planet are diet related. Two of the top five. Right, so that goes back to your graph, and you guys have got to get all of your happiness <laughs> down to the age of 60 or 70, because um, that's pretty much where we're at. Um, medical costs, humongous. Now, I know all of your countries have different medical situations and setups, but ultimately it all comes down to money at the end of the day. Um, I, w I want to talk about um, the United States. I've been doing campaigns in there just recently. Um, and there's reasons for that. Um, and I think, just, j just so you know, I've got that as a reference point. I think many countries uh, from sort of, cons you know, capitalist countries or consumerism or whatever, you know, a lot of that sort of certainly began or started in the States. They're a little bit more advanced than most countries. Um, certainly, I look to America as our future from a health and cost statistic. And um, England's right up there. Um, so let me just quote some sort of costs. So you just... You know, let's just forget emotion and death. Let's just think about cost and money, because this is important when we're talking about businesses and, 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 and governments. If you're uh, obese, uh, medical costs are 42%, nearly 50% more expensive than a regular person. Now, that probably doesn't surprise you. Um, but when you, most of your population is getting that way, we have a massive amount of money being spent sort of uh, trying to fix people when it's too late. Um, it costs the American government, just, just think about this in cash, it's lots of numbers. It costs the American government $90 billion a year in obesity alone. That's $10 million an hour, right? <laughs> and um, in the next 20 years, it's set to go to $139 billion. We're talking, we're talk, we're talking we're talking countries' national GDP here for some people. You know, we're talking about big money. Think what we could do with that money. Um, when I was in America, I think, you know, and again, just to sort of finish off that sort of American reference, it's, you know, I was based in LA for nearly two, three months, campaigning pretty much singly against the head of the, the superintendent of the school district. Um, shouldn't have been in the job, wasn't up to it, um, and uh, was 15 years out of date. And um, luckily, I got him fired, which is great. Um, and um, yeah, it, it, was, it, it was good. It, and, and, and learn this about government, guys. When we started scratching around the side and meeting other people in government and all sorts of other people that I can't mention, they all wanted him gone as well. So it's ridiculous. They had this kind of stagnant character that was stopping productivity and, and, and new things happening. Anyway, to move on from that. Um, I was working in poor communities in LA, and people think of LA as fit, buff, rich, beautiful, and it is in many ways, um, but it's a, it, uh, lesser so than the reality of LA, which is a lot of poverty, hardship, and in view of the Hollywood sign was food deserts. Food deserts, no fresh food available. Fast food on every corner, right, but no fresh food. For a poor family, that had the common sense to not buy the crap, right, and watch their children get ill, like every other child. We're talking, by the way, we're talking about school districts which have 80% obesity. 80. Eight out of 10 kids. Um, it would take them four hours to get on a bus and get fresh food. So, you know, I think what we're talking about as well is environment. You know, um, the environment in which you live in is shaping your health. It's just not just about bad decisions and bad choices and about you being greedy. It's about your environment. And that's something that we need to control. Um, so where do I go next? Under five children. Um, this is a new statistic that's quite interesting. Uh, and it sort of contrasts the American reference, okay? Because uh, um, we... Let's put it up there, let's get, if we've got the graph. It's really important that you guys know it's just not America. If you look at the graph of under five diabetes, right, look where America is smack bang in the middle, pretty much, next to Brazil. Above it is Brazil, Australia, Jordan, Jamaica, Uruguay, Peru, you know, the, the list continues. Look at the graph. This is under five-year-olds. This is babies, guys. I have a five-year-old, okay? Um, 
obviously, this is a new statistic, so we can get rid of that now. But the point is, guys, is that uh, junk food and certainly sugar and high fructose corn syrup is massively involved in this. You can't, no scientist in the world can debate this at all. Um, so, I mean, I think the thing to remember, I mean, I'm a little bit older than you, I'm 35. Um, when I was a kid living in that little village, um, I, loved a I loved a can of Coke, and I'm sure many of you do. Um, and, uh, you know, on someone's birthday, we used to go to McDonald's, and we'd get in a boat, and we'd wear a hat, <laughs> and we'd have a nice little happy meal. Yay! Woohoo! And we'd go swimming afterwards. It was great. But the, the thing that's changed, you know, is, is that these foods aren't treats anymore. They're becoming part of our diet. I have worked in so many communities in England, Australia, and America where these are not treats, these are dinner. Breakfast, lunch, and forget water, by the way, guys. I've seen so many families that only hydrate on sugary drinks. What happens is they die young. End of. End of story. So, um, I, sh I want you to sort of feel some of my pain here, right? If you want... I'm, look, you're all bright people, you know... To, to, to want to make change in food and the landscape and, and the soil and, and handling water and farming, I, I don't have to ask you if you want that, because anyone with half a brain would want that, because they want to get on with life and do other things and just enjoy. But, you know, the reality is, is diet-related disease and all the junk food and crap and farming issues that go with it is very boring to the public. A lot of my expression to the public is hampered by mega facts, me mega statistics, science reviews, and how can a normal person in any of your countries think, ah, oh, I'll do that instead, or oh, I'll, I'll, I'll go that direction. So a lot of my job is challenged by trying to make a simple point to the public to make them really, really fucking angry, okay? And that's the important thing. Now, it's really hard, it's really hard. The other thing is, guys, is, you know, we can't just blame any one person. It's a whole load of minutiae. It's a whole load of different little things. And governments, by the way, hate that. Because governments like single answers. And I've worked with, for seven years with three governments. And I, they love simple things. What's the one thing that we can do? Nothing. What's the one thing we can do? Nothing. Give me one... Th nothing. Um... So, I have to tell the story to the public. You, you can see this crap and sugar and all that sort of stuff infiltrating town, cities, villages, first and third world countries. It's happening already, right? So, I had to make a point in Los Angeles. And I, I guess I'm showing you this because if you're going to do this, I need you to be creative and, and, and kind of get people to care in the same way. So, everyone in, a, in, in LA, everyone when I first got there for the first two months, did not care about flavoured milk. Now, let's just put it in perspective. We, in LA, they serve 800,000 meals a day to children. Most of those are free school meals because they're poor, okay? Now, most of those have a breakfast and a lunch. Now, to get the money from the government to pay for the free school meal, they've got to have a milk. Now, flavoured milk, chocolate milk, strawberry milk, right? There's more milk per 100 grams in a flavoured milk than a can of Coke. Sorry, there's more sugar in a 100 mil... There's more sugar in 100 mils of milk than a can of Coke. You get me? Are you with me? Now, I don't know about you, but I grew up with white milk. And it was fine for me. But the point is, and this is the real point, four-year-old. Who's got a four-year-old in the, in, in the room here? Put your hand up. Or a, a child that's been through that. You're still young. All right, well, get busy. Get, get on with it. Um, <laughs> I've got four. I've done four in ten years. You've got to speed up. <laughs> And I think they're all mine as well. Um, <laughs> that's a joke. She's a good woman, honestly. Um, <laughs> um, my, my point is, imagine that four-year-old, that little bundle of joy, okay? School system, two milks a day. 18, right? Now, remember, this is not the shitty food. This is not the lunch. This is not the crap in the lunch, and it's not the crap that they eat on the way home from work, and it's not the crap that they eat when they're at home. This is just milk, guys, right? Let me show you how much added sugar goes in just the milk of LA milk in a week. That's, so what I have to do, 
This is my job. I have to go and buy an old wrecked bus, cut the roof off, and go and dump white sand, but the equivalent weight of white sand in sugar, and tell LA, this is what you're doing to your kids. OK? And look, here's the good thing, right? Before you judge any country, anyone, when you give the public, and, and, and I, I've been to many countries, but I, I believe it's true of the humankind, when you give the public good, clear information, they make really good choices, OK? Never forget that. And the trouble is, is we got a kind of... So anyway, let's just cut along. I got the guy fired, the new guy came in, they've banned flavoured milks, and they've put in new efforts to the school food, and they're getting a load more fresh food, and that's the end of that story. Moving on. Um, <laughs> Uh, you, saw, you saw Brittany up here earlier. She was one of the girls that I worked in Huntington. Um, you know, uh, she was 17 years old, and you saw it in the clip. Five years to live. Now, here's the other thing. We need to talk about obesity and weight and size. The icon of junk food has become a burger, right? Um, the icon of bad health, obesity, is obviously a very fat person. The reality is is that I've seen buff people and skinny people that are just as unhealthy, right? If you eat crap, you can get in trouble, very, very much so. So that's Brittany. Her environment was one of only one choice, only the wrong choice. So it's very hard for me in my country to not get people just going, ignorant, fat, greedy old bird, you know, oh, you know. She only, she's not educated about food. She knows nothing about her food. Her mum doesn't. She has no choice. That's what happens. This is Natasha. This is in England. This is my country, in Rotherham. Um, you know, we're talking about so many mothers that bring their kids up, not even sitting at a table, styrofoam, chips and cheese one day, chips and burger the next, chips and pizza the next. And don't forget about salad or veg. The point is, you know, this is happening in many countries. So... Well, I guess what I'm trying to say is the Western world has got it wrong. We've got it wrong. And if you come from a developing country, please do not look at us for inspiration because we're getting it wrong. Okay. I think the reality is, uh, and, and I have to look at you and your generation for this, look, we, we, we can try and fix the problem of bad health, obesity, and it does connect back into famine and how we... Uh, look after, care, pay for, and, and nourish other people not so lucky. But we require, and I'm going to say future, because I have very little, you know, I've, I've been nothing but, don I, I am personally demoralised about governments that I work with, okay? Mayors, rabbis, priests, pastors, whatever, uh, councillors, government, local leaders, need to get savvy about allowing certain stuff to change in their environment. They are in control of a lot, right? Whether it's education, whether it's programs in their area, whether it's letting someone come into an area and just open, 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 open. They, they can't just keep taking the money and thinking it's great, it's cheap, it's nice, because it's, the, the data is very, very clear, is that it's killing the world, and the world can't sustain all the food that we're making anyway. Okay, I want to give you an example before I move into the next bit, which is nutrition transition. This is a word I'd never use, but this is what the scientists use. Um, just talk about developing countries. China's really interesting. Where's the Chinese gang? China. Woo! Okay, Shimon. Um, look, I, I think it's, it's fair to say that there's some fantastic, interesting things happening there at the moment, and, and, and there's, there's a lot that we don't know. Um, but the, the, a little interesting thing is this. Look, the people in government in China are not stupid. They're, they're quite bright and clever. You know, they know what's going on. They know the international data. They know of what's going wrong in all of our countries. Okay? They know it. And just like a month ago, and also the, the Chinese government are very, very aware of what they call Western-style diseases. Okay? Very clear. They've just done a deal with McDonald's for 34,000 McDonald's to go around the whole of China in public, government-owned petrol stations. One decision, probably by a very small amount of people, will have a massive, dramatic, devastating effect 
quickly on that country. Think about it. And, and, and I'm not slagging nothing off, I'm just saying one person, five people, one decision, a future. You, you, once you got them in, once you sign that contract, you can't get them out. Well, maybe you can. Okay. Uh, nutrition transition. Um, what is nutrition transition? That is basically when you go from a lifestyle or a country um, of food, a bit like your grandmother's, steeped in tradition. Um, the interesting thing, and you've really, I'm just going to paint there, look, just recently scientists, somehow, I'm not going to bore you with that, but um, found out that mankind, us, ha have been cooking in one way, shape or form for two million years. And they know that because of the way the teeth changed and, and stuff, found. I don't know what they do, but that's what they say. Um, I mean, the react is, where we've got to is steeped in thousands and thousands and millions of years of evolution. Now, the food that is individual to all of your countries, all those things that you shouted out to me, all those memories, yeah? Um, they're, they're starting to disappear in certainly most of the world quite quickly. And if you're from a country that doesn't understand what I'm saying, two or three years, maybe, maybe a little bit longer, it'll happen. So nutrition transition is going from old food to new. And we know what that is, guys. It's a Western-style diet where we go from hands, local food, to factories, and you know it's going to be high in salt, fat, sugar, all that stuff. Um, I think you have to look at it as a war. I've named it the food revolution. It is a war, guys. You know, instead of, um, you know, let's, ju let's just be very, very clear. Um, I think it's, in my experience, um, I'm rarely inspired and surprised by the over-intelligence and humanity of politicians. Um, in actual fact, I personally wouldn't employ most of them. Um, And I know it's easy to slag off government, and I'm sure it's a hard job. Um, but that's what I've seen. Um, however, most people from big, big food business are really clever. They're really clever. And possibly they're nice people. Possibly. <laughs> and um, you've got to understand that they're really strategic. They're really clever. They've got money, they've got marketing and they've got a product, and they're way more strategic than any government in the world, okay? Just get that. So you've got to look at nutrition transition, or the change of food, or the change in fucking health, right, as a war. Instead of shipping in guns and tanks, they're shipping in food, junk food, sugary drinks, right? You know the drill. So you've got to think of it like that. One of the things, it's a really, and I, I, I'm not sure if I'm slagging this off, or being horrible, or saying be careful, right? All the scientists that study food, food culture, food trends, disease, cultural issues, they are witnessing a reality of what I call globo kids. Globo kids, right? Now, this is at the same time as technology, phones, right? Lovely. This is great, isn't it? I've, you know, I only got one when I was 20, uh, 25 actually, I was a bit late. Um, fantastic. Um, globo kids. And, and, you know, it's sort of showing that more and more of us are kind of into the same thing socially, whether it's music, whether it's film, we're sharing information. But, of course, food is well in with that as well. You know, um, the sign for a lot of people of a perfect night out, you know, is, you know, more than often sort of TVs, Game Boys, uh, you know, having a pizza, junk food, all that sort of stuff. We're kind of, we, we are definitely, the fact is we are becoming homogenised, right? And so I guess what I'm saying to you is... And that's sort of at the beginning why I said dream of your food, dream of those moments. Because I don't know what the answer is, but you guys, and your children especially, will have to tread a very, very fine line between becoming a globo kid, which could have its positivities, and losing your individuality, losing your cultures. And it's really happening. It's really, really happening. And... I think that brings me nicely onto sort of education. This is something I'm really, really passionate about. And you're talking to a kid that came out of school with nothing. Um, when, I, when I left school, 
I was so pleased to never have to write and do exams ever again. <laughs> Thank God for that. Um, but ever since I've left, I've never stopped doing it. Um, I've written 15 books now. It's terrible. But, um, so... <laughs> I used, to go, I used to go to special needs when I was a kid, and uh, if my special needs kit uh, for like extra tuition, if she knew that I'd written 15 books, she would have, she'd be turning in a grave. Okay, let's, <laughs> let's, talk about, um, let's talk about education. Okay, historically, basically, if we look at mankind, for 99.9% .9 of the time, teaching, education, came through mum, more than often. Bit of dad, maybe, hunter-gatherer. Um, certainly nonna, nanny. And certainly the village. Okay? That's how we were taught to survive. And, of course, in those days, a proportion of our day spent on food was like about 70% back in, back in the day. I'm talking a few hundred years ago, thousands of years ago, hunter-gatherer. Okay? Um, because if we didn't get food, we'd die. So being streetwise, uh, but, you know, you don't, you, you don't want to send your kid down a street not being streetwise. You know, if there's pickpocketers about or if there's people, you know, be careful over there. When it comes to food, you've got to be streetwise about food. And education is the keys to being streetwise, okay? And for all of time, it's been passed down through family. Now, for many countries here today, and for possibly the rest of you in the future years to come, maybe a decade, maybe two, um, mums and dads are all out working. Pri priorities are changing. And... Therefore, we have to be really clever about how we educate kids about food. Now, look, the, when you talk to scientists about food and health, they argue about lots of little things. The one thing they don't argue about, the one thing that brings us all together today, is that food education is the biggest defense, the biggest armor weaponry against the fight against obesity, diet-related disease. And I actually do believe famine as well because you need people clued up about the soil, the water, farming, and food, okay? Um, so, only in my eyes at the moment, and you might have much better ideas than me, if I was spending money, if I was in control of a government, the one place where most of our kids are, in England, Europe, America, I can say 180 to 190 days of the year, is school. And... Most of our countries have either got, well, most of them haven't got a food education set up. If they have, it's rubbish, it's not relevant, and it doesn't help them be streetwise about food. And at the end of the day, I suppose what I'm saying to you lovely people is if you don't do your maths homework, you ain't going to die young. Right? Don't, and don't believe that. If anyone tells you that, they're lying. Right? <laughs> Statistically, on the planet, and for most of the planet, first generation of kids expected to live a shorter life than their parents. If you don't learn about food, you will die young. We all eat, hopefully, every day, and we've got to know about it. And if we know about it, we can make better choices. And through food education, I really, really, truly believe that you can infiltrate... I mean, most, the biggest priority is pregnant women, straight away. That's where it all starts, in the tummy. What they're eating while that mother's pregnant. We've got to be strategic, clever, relevant to the area. We've got to get that baby fit, right? When the baby is born, the second most important bit, right? How they look after the baby, breastfeed, and all of that sort of stuff. Now, this is, this, if you speak to any health specialist around the world, this is where the big problems start. And if you start like that, it's so hard to fix it later on, right? If you have food knowledge, you know, little school, big school, you have got the best chance in the world of having your children, your new generations coming through, being armed to make good decisions. Now, I want to tell you what that means. If people are armed with general more information, right, and the ignorance out there is phenomenal and very consistent, right, um, a couple of things happen for me that are important. You get those knowledgeable people through government. Okay? They make different decisions because they're aware of so much more. The Chinese thing is a great... You don't have to make quick snap decisions like that. Okay? The other thing is 
Um, the probably the most powerful thing in this world is the dollar, the yen, the pound, right? Money, right? That's, that's what is driving so much. What I've seen happen in England, which is really interesting, in the last seven years, um, which, you know, me and a handful of other people have been stirring, right, is when you empower a community or a country to expect more, to know more, even some of what you might call the bad guys start becoming good. If, I can't believe I'm going to say this to you. In the last five years, McDonald's UK, and, and I think possibly Europe, but definitely France, has done probably more in procurement and ethics of eggs, milk, beef, salad, starting to do a few more bits on balance, right? But they're going well in the right direction. They're doing more than a lot of mid-sized businesses. And we have, to, we have to say, well done. We have to. Oh, it hurts me. Well done. We have to say it. But, but, that's because the public, well, there's two things, really. We can be cynical. It's because either the manager of that company was very clever and wanted to get in front of the game, chase the pound, and preempt a problem of his population becoming more um, sort of fussy about what they're eating, or they were just doing the right thing. Either or, I don't care, I want it to move. I want them all to move. Now, the stark contrast of that is in America, that ain't the case. Okay? And the reason is, is because the public yet, as a whole, haven't risen up. And it is happening. It is happening. You watch this space. It is happening. Um, but it hasn't happened yet. So, if you know about food, if you've been educated about food, if you feel the love, okay, then you can be a better parent. Yeah? You can be a better parent. If you know about food, where it comes from, how it affects your body, you know, the fact that it gives you energy, that it doesn't make you, oh, you know, you know, food and what you eat can affect, you know, it's been proven now by Oxford and Yale that it speeds up your brain neurons. It allows you to attain and keep more information, up to about 11%. Now, I don't know about you lovely, clever people. I can be pretty good, about 70% good most days, right? Now... I'll try and be better, but that extra 10% to me is gold. <laughs> I don't know about you, but would you like 10%? <laughs> um, I would. So I think when you look at health, uh, productivity, ideas, fantasy, moving forward in this world in the best condition that you can be, you know, knowing about food allows you to be a better parent, a better boss. Where do you spend half of your time, or if not more, work? How many canteens in this world? Forget kids and schools for a second. We haven't even got onto hospitals and the shitty food in there, right? Where, in, in your business, small or big, 10 or 1,000, right? How much crappy food is in there? How, by having one person, young or old, in that business, fighting in a business? I employ people in my business to fight with me. Fight with me. Go out, find things, tell me to do better. Employ someone to make you go out and do better. Imagine how much pro productivity creation would go up if you just fed them right. So you can be a better boss, a better parent, and of course, eventually, a better politician that hopefully makes good decisions, not like the McDonald's one in China. So I suppose what I'm trying to say, I know I'm biased. I know I love food, and it, it was my savior as far as education was concerned. But it is one of the most important things in our lovely little planet. And the knowledge of food will carry us all well. And the patterns of education are way down, and they're dropping badly, and, and your generation needs to fight for that. And I haven't even got on to the biggest problem in the next 40 years, which will be water. Water is the biggest problem in food in the next 40 years. There's not enough of it. It's displaced. Um, Water in food, on any packaging, has always been often the first ingredient and the cheapest. Water really has, to many parts of the world, forgive me, but for many parts of the world, certainly in, in, in the Western world, has no value. It doesn't really. It will have a value in the next 40 years. It will cause mass migration of communities, it will cause wars, and it will send the price of food way up, and it's all self-inflicted. Um, 
So I'm not going to go into that, but I have, to be, I have to be a believer in that education will save us. I have to, because how can we be so miserable about everything? Because it is bad. Um, so the question is, is what am I going to do? What are you going to do? Um, I guess I, yeah, I am biased. Whatever avenue you're going to go down, it would be nice if you could be as passionate about food and the planet and, and, and growing, because it will affect whatever you do. So there's something that I would love One Young World to do. I, I think this is, this is why I'm here. Um, first of all, look at a personal choice. Um, just, just look at yourself. I mean, interestingly, we, we did look at yourself. And what was very interesting is you thought you were going to live to 100. You, you all said that you could cook, which I'm not saying you can't. Um, <laughs> you all can cook. Um, but uh, what was the... What, can we just bring that, uh, that stat up again, the one on the food? I just want to... There was something funny in it when I looked at it. Um, so we'll come back to this. Uh, they'll be scampering around in the background. It was... No, 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 the, one, the, one that, the survey that we did here with the guys today. Sorry, I've thrown a curveball. Okay, no, 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 uh, no, no, the other ones. Uh, it was funny, I can't remember, sorry, forgive me. Okay, back to the thing then, I don't want to slow you down. Back to the thing. So personal choice, look at yourself, look at your family. What can you do to inspire education, inspire change? Um, what can you do in your community, in your streets, in your towns, in your cities? Um, that's, that's a real good one. Um, I have a request. Um, I have a request that c I think you might like, right? The timing of us meeting today is a beautiful thing because although what I'm asking for is a bottom-up approach, I want people to rise up. I want the youngsters to rise up. I want us to do it on an international level. We have this ability between us to do this. And we've, we need a food revolution. I can't just be going to the UK and Australia and America, and I want to go everywhere, but how can I get everywhere? We need to do it. But um, we've got, in government terms, I guess, the most important meeting in the last five years happening in, on the 19th and 20th of September. Right? It's the UN meeting, global meeting, on non-communicable non, non non diseases, which is what we're all talking about now. Okay? What I'd love you to do is let's mix it up. One young world, let's mix it up. Because I'll tell you one thing, all the world experts that I meet are not impressed by the UN. They don't believe they're going to agree on anything tangible, anything that's going to make true change, and they're all pulling their hair out. These are people that have been working on tracking all of your countries, I can promise you, for the last 30, 40 years, through many dictators and governments and you name it, right? The UN ain't pulling their finger out, right? We can create, I'd like to create a nice bit of merry hell, right? So I'd like you to, number one, go to the Facebook page, right? Uh, it's Food Revolution Community. Um, and when you go through to that, sign up immediately. I don't know if you can put a screen grab of the website. You can sign up. By signing up, one, it means we have a contact. Two, it means you've signed the petition. Okay? Um, and we've already got over 700,000 votes to go to the UN. I want you to help me get it to a million. Right? So that's the first thing you do. Then you can like it so all your friends can see it. Okay? Then, if you want to, if I can make your life easier, go to uh, foodrevolution.com forward slash sign. Uh, and there'll be uh, uh, basically a page that will help you, facilitate you, write a letter to your, U your, your UN ambassador. Now, I've written some stuff. I've, I've written some stuff. Um, uh, I've written some stuff uh, to... So, forgive me. I need your help to write these letters. You can I've written one. You can change it. Just Google who your UN ambassador is of your country, and then there will be an email address. Send it in. But don't just you do it. I would love you to do it for a little moment in time to beg, ask all of your communities and your friends to do the same. And I don't want the 19th and the 20th to be what the world experts that I respect from all over the world think is going to happen, which is basically nothing. Okay? If we can get those numbers up on the petition and the letters, well, I'm going to do it anyway, but I'm going to be writing to Ban Ki-moon, who's basically one of the top guys at the UN. Um, I'll be delivering... Um, 
I'll be delivering a printout of every single one. So I'll, I'll just bring a forklift truck and put a petition in, in paper. All right, maybe that's not very eco-friendly. We'll email it. We'll just clog up his inbox. Um, how times have changed in campaigning, eh? Um, <laughs> I'd love you to help me with this. Um, that's the end of my time. Um, it, it is a pleasure. I, I do take today really, really seriously. I believe in One Young World. And we, the only thing we can dream of is that education can create cultures of control and activism in any way, shape, or form. We need to empower mums and dads to be able to have an opinion and say, no, 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 I don't like that. I think we can do that together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Fantastic. So good. Thank you very much. What an amazing job. A big, huge applause.